Hey team, welcome to our episode on the latest My Hero Academia movie, and it is called World Heroes Mission. This is animation. Are you ready? And what's super interesting about this episode for us is we've got a pretty good mix of people with regards to how much My Hero Academia they've watched. In fact, we have a special guest host who is my wife, Jessica. So say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be on the show. I've even got my animation gear on. Sweet. Get that at Teespring. We will have a link in the description. And as always, Merv is here to add a writer's perspective to what we do. Say hi, Merv. Hello. Just before we get started, like I said, we've got a diverse set of My Hero Academia experience. So first, I have watched now about 88 episodes of My Hero Academia. I actually did the math yesterday. 40 hours of my life has been spent watching My Hero Academia. Jessica, my wife, has probably watched about a dozen My Hero Academia episodes with me, so she's got some experience. And then Merv has watched the latest movie, World Heroes Mission, and another one of the movies, and that is the extent of his experience with My Hero Academia. So you're going to get a perspective from folks who've watched a lot of it, a little bit of it, and not much of it. So you know, based on where you are in that spectrum, the value of this movie film. So as always, before we move on with anything else, we've got to do our rating. We do our rating. If this is your first episode with us, we do our rating on a Likert scale, one to five, based on how likely we are to recommend the movie and or show to our friends, family, and subscribers. One being we will never talk about this again after we record this, <laughs> and five being we're going to be running around telling people to watch this movie, film, and or show. So is everybody ready to throw up your rating for My Hero Academia? World Heroes Mission. Yes. Yeah. Will you recommend this to us? First comes Rock, John Ken Pawn. All right. So, as always, we're going to do rock, paper, scissors, and then you throw up your numbers. So, first comes Rock, Jane Ken, Ken Pawn. All right. We have a discussion. So, Jessica <laughs> and I both loved this movie film, and we will be recommending it to people because you gave it a five. Because I gave it a five. Very good. Thank you for calling that out. Jessica gave it a five. Both of you. And I gave I gave it a two. And Merv gave it a two. Mm -hmm. Probably because there's no choice at the end. That's just a guess. That's not why, mine. actually. <laughs> right. Very good. So it should be a good discussion. Again, just a, a, another reminder not to go too long in the tooth with this. But just because we rate something a certain way doesn't mean we did or did not enjoy it. Right. It's would we recommend it? Yeah. A little bit of history, a little bit of an intro here. The movie itself is teased in season five, episode 16 and an after credit scene. So what this means is for the first time, a My Hero Academia movie can be considered canon. Now, the creators said that there won't be a lot of callbacks, if any callbacks to this content, but it can be considered canon where the previous movies were just kind of offshoots of the uh, of the series of the anime or the the manga so it is canon but won't have a lot of lasting impact on the overall story a couple of things about our main characters who they are and, and what they can do so this might be old news for some of you but if you're new to my hero academia then this will matter so deku is our main character uh, in the anime and, and seemingly one in this movie as well. He also goes by Midoriya, but I think for the sake of this episode, we'll just stick to Deku. His quirk or his ability is called One for All, and this power is passed between heroes and refined each time it's passed on. Deku is actually the ninth wielder of One for All, and what it does is it allows the user to stockpile a bunch of power and enhance their abilities to a superhuman level, very Superman-esque in that way. Bakugo, or Kachan, we'll go with Bakugo, 
Uh, his quirk is explosion, and his deal is he sweats a nitroglycerin-like substance that he can explode. And he wears a couple of gauntlets that look like big grenades, and those allow him to store a bunch of that nitroglycerin sweat up to make big explosions, and he's very angry all the time, which I love. Shodo, probably the third main hero in this, his quirk is called Half Cold, Half Hot. And he has ice powers that he got from his mother on his on the right side of his body. And then he has fire side from his father on the left side of his body. So he has both fire and ice powers. So that's a little bit about like the main three heroes that we see the most of in this movie. And just to kind of set a baseline. Either of you have anything on any of that before I move on to what this movie film is about? No, I, I didn't know any of that. Yeah, that's I wanted to create a little bit of a baseline just so that, you know, I, we would have an understanding of kind of the powers and stuff like that. So very good. All right. So here's what, in my own words, this movie film is about. It is necessary to set the record straight regarding our tale. You must study this series of events. You may find more. You may not. So there's this quirk doomsday theory that quirks or superpowers will become so powerful that they will be the end of humanity. A group called Humanize takes this to heart and they are committed to ending all quirks and restoring humanity back to before quirks existed. I think it's Humanize. Humanize. What did I say? Humanize. 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 You yeah, said humorize. an actual word. There's is like a made <laughs> yeah. up but sounds cool. Yeah. Humorize. Yeah. Humorize. Um, thank you for that correction because I actually do have it written wrong. So thank you for that. So if you're not familiar in the My Hero Academia world, 80% of people have quirks or superpowers of some kind or another. And then the rest of the folks do not. So Humorize's goal is to return the world back to before those quirks existed. The leader of Humorize, Flecked, turn has led the group to create a gas that causes quirks to go out of control and we actually see a test of this happen in the movie and it's it's bad news bears and then flex announces that he has placed bombs with this gas at various places around the world so the world heroes association sends pro heroes and some ua students high school students engaged in uh, superhero work studies at various hero agencies to the various locations to stop the bombs from going up. So Flex, what's his name? Flex Turn. It's like, we've got these bombs. We're trying to get rid of all the quirks in the world. We want humans to go back to just regular humans, no powers. And they're in all these places. So the heroes get together and they're like, all right, we got to go to all these different places. And get these bot get rid of these bombs get them disarmed that type of thing and that's why it's world heroes mission along the way deku gets tangled up with rody rody right rody rody soul a kid trying to take care of his siblings after losing his parents he does this by committing petty crime turns out rody is connected to the humorized plot in a way that I will not spoil at this point because we're trying to keep the spoilers a little light and not give away any any major, major plot points until later in the episode. So some other things happen. We get a Deku, Shoto, and Bakugo team up. They face Fleck turn at the end, his interesting quirk and his subordinates. And then the story resolves. Along the way, there are some wrongful accusations. There's a road trip. There's a lot of new characters and new quirks. There's new friendships. And as always in My Hero Academia, a ton of power up. So that is in my words, in my understanding about what this My Hero Academia movie is about. All right. With all that said, Merv, you are a writer. Yep. You know about writing things. I do. So... How did they do in writing My Hero Academia World Heroes Mission? Regale us with your wit, storyteller. Uh, they did a, a, a few things right and a few things wrong. 
when I give it a two, it's mostly in terms of I, this is something I definitely would not recommend to people new to anime. I'll talk about that more when we get into the diss track. But one of the things that they did really well that I really liked was how they handled the character arc. And so a character arc is basically a protagonist goes through some sort of change or has the opportunity to change and and fails at that change. So when you start, there is some lie is what a lot of people call it or a wound that that character believes and it is harmful to them. They are confronted with the truth and then they have the opportunity to change. If it's a positive arc, they change for the good. If it's a negative arc, they, they change for the bad, believe a stronger lie. If it's a flat arc, they do not change at all. A flat arc is not the same thing as having no arc. If you have no character arc, it's not a story. It's just a series of events happening that you are watching. So if you're very bored, that is often the case. But in this case, there was a pretty good arc, and it was with the protagonist, which is not Deku. He is the main character, but Rhodey, who we meet, is he? I assume he's not a normal character. He's a character made for this movie. Yeah, he is completely new for this movie. Yep. Which makes a lot of sense, especially what you were saying, how the movies aren't canon or generally aren't canon. It makes sense to introduce a new character and make them a protagonist, because if one of the main characters changes, then they have to change on the show as well. So we will get into some spoilers here about Rhodey and his connection to Humorize, but not too much. Can you can you talk about or you probably will, but can you talk about protagonist versus main character, what those mean and kind of why? Yeah, the main character is the character that we spend the most time with. So they are often either they can be a narrator, Nick Carraway and the Great Gatsby is what most people are familiar with. But Gatsby is the protagonist, even though Carraway has a change. Your protagonist is generally speaking, whatever character the is the story the the character that changes the character that holds the arc 95 percent of the time they're the same character you are watching a character come of age become a hero go through some sort of uh, quest and that is the change that they they learn something they have some sort of growth and they are also our main character in this case deku is our is our main character because we are following him but Rhodey is the character that gets the arc. So he is the protagonist. And his arc, the first, the lie he believes at the beginning is that no one is worth trusting. He believes he was betrayed by his father, who went off to join Humorize and left him and his siblings behind. His mother died much before this, uh, right after his youngest sibling was born. So it was just his father and Rhodey, who's the oldest brother, and then two very, very young siblings. Because he was left behind, he believes that there is no one worth trusting. He starts with this kind of lie, this wound from what he feels was being betrayed by his father. And so he goes through the story and he spends some time with Deku. And early on, he is cocky and kind of sure of himself and doesn't really let Deku get close. As they move through the story, he kind of opens up a little bit to Deku, and then he's finally confronted with the truth that his father, and this is, I guess, a, a big spoiler, that his father did not betray, but was actually forced into humorize and actually did something heroic. I'll just leave it at that. And that allows him to really open up to Deku become kind of a hero himself towards the end of the movie, fight on and learn to trust, notably learn to trust Deku. So his character arc is a positive one. He becomes a better person. And this is shown through early on, like you mentioned, he does petty crimes. And at the end, he's sweeping a bar, kind of doing odd jobs for cash instead of doing crimes for cash. Really what we're looking at is Oftentimes, characters have a need and a want. 
So what Rhodey thinks he needs is to protect his family, or what he wants to do is protect his family all alone, all on his own. He thinks no one else can help him do it. It's just him protecting his siblings. But what he really needs, that's his want, but what he really needs is to know that there are other people out there that he doesn't have to do it on his own, that he can trust, that he can open up. And when you have a a positive character arc, they, generally speaking, end up with what they need and not with what they want. Sometimes it's both. This, in this case, it's both. He gets what he needs to protect his family, but he also gets what he wants, friendship and uh, trust from someone he trusts and someone trusts him back. And that's a positive character arc. If you have a negative character arc, you kind of get the opposite. They're confronted with the truth and they make a choice, usually to believe a stronger lie or you get a flat, like I said, a flat character arc. Again, not the same as no arc. No arc is just you're watching a series of, of events take place. There's no conflict. There's no growth at all. Generally speaking, if a character has a flat character arc, there's a it's very plotty and someone else or the audience goes through some growth. Yeah. And, and even though it's technically canon, that it's canon that won't be revisited but it still fits within the story. So the creator made sure that there wasn't conflict. And I'm not positive, but I believe some of the other films had conflict with the established canon. So that's why they were one-offs, right? Mm -hmm. But this one, I think also the distance where Rhodey lives, if they would have made him in Japan, I think people would have questioned, why isn't Rhodey in more of these episodes? Why isn't he more integral part to this? He was introduced. But since he's halfway across the planet, I think that's an easy out as well for that. Is that a real, are those real places? No, <laughs> okay. I don't think so. I was thinking that too. Geography is not my, is not my uh, deal. I did do a little, uh, when they showed the place they were going in America. And of course it was New York, like where it always has to be New York or LA. But they showed the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, which was also pretty funny. I was very confused. They're just yeah. like, we're in America. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. The Statue of Liberty looking at the Golden Gate Bridge. I don't I don't think it was <laughs> it wasn't that, but very much an alternate world. Jessica, you haven't got to speak much yet, and I know you'll get to talk a lot more when we get to like the diss track and the favorite things. Is there anything you wanted to mention about the story or what Merv said about writing or anything like that. No, I, you guys did a great job um, with with the intro. I just absolutely love the movie. <laughs> Leaving there, I was like, wow, I can't wait to talk about this. And it was so tough not to say anything. You know, I got to hold it in and wait and to write down my thoughts. But um, I just so enjoyed it. And I've got a whole list of likes. <laughs> That I can't wait to share. <laughs> it is tough. This is the first. This is the first one we watched together, and like all three of us went. Yeah, and it is yeah. Very difficult. Yep. And then we're walking out trying to think of something to talk about that isn't the movie. Yeah. So look at this weather. Oh, this weather is nice. It's theater that we're at. Good seats. Yeah, because this is our first discussion because we wanted it to be most authentic. Yeah, so it's like I'm holding it in. I'm making my list. So literally, I'm just waiting for you to get to the likes. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, and I would say that this is, I would agree with Merv that if you are brand new to anime, may not be the best place to start. You damn nerd! <laughs> if you haven't watched any My Hero Academia, I would also say though if you are an anime fan especially modern anime this movie and my hero academia are very modern anime you've got a very you know positive uplifting protagonist main character what have you you've got a lot of heroes that are good just for the sake of being good very superman in that way you could make the argument even western like the superhero genre has a lot of that it's fantasy has a lot of the bad, bad and the good, good. And that was, has been popular over the last few years as well. Not as popular as anime. Yeah. Yeah. I like what anime does with, I'll just say it. I prefer what anime does with villains 
overall versus what we see in the West with villains. The, there tends to be a lot more dimension or at least um, relatability with the villains. I would say Thanos is, is kind of this because you can kind of understand where he's coming from and you could see why he believes the way he does. A lot of modern anime villains, you can understand where they're coming from and even feel some sort of, if not sympathy, empathy for their cause, which I think is is pretty cool as well. That's often, uh, if we're speaking of the Marvel movies specifically, the first one, which is setting up the hero, often has like a paper plate villain. It's like, I'm bad and I want power. But when you get into the sequels, I think some of the villains get better. My favorite Marvel villain is actually Ego the Living Planet. And I know a lot of people don't like Guardians of the Galaxy too, but in my mind, he's the best villain in a Marvel movie. Well, definitely falls into that you can understand where he's mm-hmm. coming from category mm-hmm. for sure. Those are definitely All the right, best let's, villains. Let's talk about what we did not like so much about My Hero Academia World Heroes Mission. I see you have made your decision. Now let's see you enforce it. And uh, just so you can start talking, why don't you start with something that you did not like so much? Oh, you guys, I loved this movie so much. I think it is my favorite anime movie. So it was really hard for me to find anything that I didn't like about it. But I do have two things. Okay, just start with one and that way we don't uh, don't use them all up. Yeah, because I so, got a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the the first thing that I, I did not like is that they made Midoriya, I'm sorry, Deku, a wanted guy. I felt like that my heart dropped a little bit. I was like, oh, I'm going to be stressed out this whole time. And I love heroes so much. I just I love how they shine. I love that they come in and save the day. And this movie and series, the idea of quirks is so interesting to me and how these heroes have such unique powers and abilities that are so creative that you just don't find anywhere else. And and I was kind of bummed uh, when, when basically he was going to be a wanted guy. And I was like, oh, I just really don't like that kind of plot. I'm stressed the whole time. I just wanted to see him shine. Uh, but it did come back around, which was nice. But I was a little bummed at that at that plot line. And the thing about that is, I'm going to piggyback off your diss here because it, I don't know what effect that had on the story at all. Yeah, other than to drive forward the fact that they needed to go somewhere else. I mean, that's the only thing I can think is that it it was the device that caused them to say, OK, we've got to leave this country and go to this other country. Right. Um. Did that matter? Well, I guess it introduced the road trip, which was yeah cool. Well, and I think it was meant to be a bonding experience with Deku and Rhodey. Yeah. And they used that plot line to bring them closer together and to build some trust between Deku and Rhodey. And Deku saved Rhodey when they were attacked and when Rhodey betrayed him when they were on the on the run and he almost turned in the suitcase and and Deku came to save him. And so I think that's why they went that route. But I think there's a couple of, there's other ways that they could have done that. They could have just set out on an adventure together for some other reason other than being wanted by everyone in the country. Yeah, you're right, though. It did force them together, though, because they were in the same, the same boat as incorrectly wanted fugitives. That's fair. Um, but yeah, this this movie is tailor made for you, like the positivity and it is is tailor made for you. So I can understand why. <laughs> and I'm um, just a you, negative you old curmudgeon. Them, so. so Bakugo is always angry, so he'll never be that popular. Look, we can go back into the uh, the archives here and it's like, did this one have a bunch of grumpy? Merv loved it. What did you say? I'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's completely unfair. But. Um, what is Merv, what is something you had on your, your diss track for this? I'm going to hold back the kind of spoilery ones for a little bit, I guess. The big thing is the, that idea of nothing's going to change. I didn't know this wasn't canon going in, but I did notice that there was literally no change in the world from the beginning to the end, except for Rhodey, which Rhodey is the story. So that's fine, but it kind of made the stakes low for me and then if i had known this wasn't canon going in the stakes would have been 
really low for me. Well, technically it's canon, but it's canon without stakes, I guess would be the best way to put it. Like it is it's part of the universe that did happen in the universe, but it's not going to impact anything going forward. Well, and here's some of the, so some of the problems I had was when, and I don't know the other characters other than Deku, when Explosion Guy and Fire and Ice Guys, Fire and Ice Guy were fighting, they would die, like be run through with spikes, and then the spikes are ripped <laughs> out of their chest and literal gallons of blood everywhere. And, and then it would cut away like a cliffhanger, and then it would come back and they'd just be fighting again. <laughs> so there's like no there's no repercussions to literally having five inch spikes on whip cords running through your body and pulling out that would just that just kills you i so want to talk about this for a minute so that is very much my hero academia and i had the same feeling when i was first watching the show because that would constantly happen heroes would get and even villains would get wounds or attacked in a way that they should die like no matter what they should die and then over time when they don't die like hardly anyone ever dies which is also a very anime thing where villains don't die heroes don't die just something happens it's very anime and in a lot of anime not all but uh, especially the more modern ones what's interesting though is they play with that so uh, heroes will get just crazy wounds and they'll be fighting, like you said, the next the next scene. Then there is a character that is introduced. And again, spoilers about My Hero Academia, so you've been warned. But there's another character that gets introduced and his name is Sir Night Eye. And his ability is that his quirk is that if he touches you and like looks into your eyes, he can see your future play out as a movie. Now, Merv, we've talked about this like time travel and this kind of foresight and things like that can break a story. Mm -hmm. So what happens a, just a few episodes after this store, potential story breaking character is introduced, he gets gutted with like a huge spike of rock, just complete hole in his body. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking he's fine. He'll make it. He'll he'll be walking. He'll just like pull it out and be walking around. No problem. A couple minutes later and he dies. And one, I loved it because it subverted yeah. my expectations. Right. I was so used to everyone just living and he dies and I'm like, yeah, wow, that's awesome. The other thing I loved is that they were smart enough to know, well, if we keep this character around, all they ever have to do is get him to see people's future and they could. Right you know fix or deal with anything so we can't keep this character so i that's an interesting one that you picked up on and uh i just i had to talk about you know how that occurs in the larger uh series overall i loved it i lo i love when they go through those big fights and they it looks like they're gonna die and they don't and i'm like wow they're alive again <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow this show's I amazing did. Yeah, I yeah, can't. it like inspires me, and I feel like All Might fuels my soul. And um, he is he shines as the wise one in this movie, but in the series, he's just such an amazing superhero and just like the ideal guy who rushes in to save the day. But anyway, there's just so much to unpack there. But I absolutely I love those parts. Here's the funny thing in this, and I'll talk about the other groups I'm in in a little bit, like the other pop culture groups I'm in, like groups of friends that I have role playing friends I play D&D with, I have board game friends I play board games with, I have writer friends that we sit around and talk about writing. And the, the most, the, the hilarious thing is in all those groups, I'm the giddy, I love heroes guy. I like happy endings. I like heroic characters. But here, but when I step into the anime club, I'm the curmudgeon. <laughs> I don't want that piece of garbage. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and with All Might, it also helps that he is basically an animated version of Jessica's dad. I mean, they say the same stuff and they sound the same. 
and he's even a big guy like All Might is. So I, I could see falling in love with that character. In fact, I've fallen more in love with that character because of it. But we are to reset the ship here. Uh, we are on the diss track. Yes, diss. Yeah. One of the ones that I have, I do love how creative My Hero Academia can get with the quirks. I love it. And I love how weird anime can get. However, I would be remiss if I didn't say the 2D Egyptian guy in this <laughs> was ridiculous and dumb. Like, I mean, I, I'm just, I, I like it. Just, that's just dumb. <laughs> <Come on> like, <laughs> he was like, <laughs> yeah, he's like a 2D drawing of an Egyptian pharaoh. Is he not in the show? Not, not that I've gotten. To, I'm on episode 88. Um, nope. I went and saw this movie twice in the theater, and in the, the first, the first time I watched it, the theater was like cracking up over that guy. <laughs> There's even a comic book guy. He's not in the movie, but he's in the show where his face is like the page, a blank page of a comic book. And his quirk is that he can make comic book sounds come to life. So when he's like, Kerblowy, Kerplow, like that happens. That sounds awesome. I'm even okay with that, but we got, I just couldn't do the Egyptian <laughs> 2D guy. It just wasn't my jams. And then he had like sayings too. I don't remember what he said. He's like, follow me, I can feed you the way and we'll make a great day. And it was just, you know, it was like really <laughs> cheesy. And he kept yeah. turning like that and he can't like go forward. He's doing some bangles, walk like an Egyptian action. Yeah. For all our 40 plus viewers. <laughs> Um, Merv, what's another one you have on your diss track? All right, well, so can we get into spoilers then since we're talking about quirks? Yeah, let's just break it. Rhodey's power is cool. That the bird, it shows his inner emotions. However, it's not used at all until once at the very end. So I knew going into the second one, it's the second time I saw it, I knew what the power was. Yeah. So you were looking for it. So I was looking for it. So what I really wanted to see was I want to see Rhodey is at the opening of the movie, very cocksure and like, hey, I, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm being chased by villains and heroes with powers, but I'm cool. And But I want what I want is the bird to be cowardly and hiding. And so I think the bird has a completely different personality than he does. But instead, the bird is either hidden or whenever we see it, it reflects exactly what he's doing at that time. Yeah, that's a waste. That's a waste. I would have thought there would be callbacks in there where on a second viewing, you would have noticed right. more with that. Right. Yeah. And there's even a point where they, and this is, this is, I've noticed very anime holding things back. They, he says it once. Deku is like, oh, what is your quirk? Oh, it's weird. I'm embarrassed. You won't laugh, will you? And then they repeat that line again later in the movie and still don't reveal it when they're fighting the big bad Fleck turn. <laughs> then there's a point where they reveal it and Deku says, oh, you can't lie. I think that's a cool power. And then immediately Ro Rhodey lies to him. And the bird is hidden, so he lies anyway, immediately, immediately after this. If you're going to hold something like that back, it has to have importance. And it didn't. So when they did the big reveal, it was like, oh, OK. And, and then I thought to myself the first time I watched the movie, I was like, well, OK, I know I'm seeing this again because we already had tickets. And I was like, I'm going to watch for that. I'm going to watch to see if. There, there are some callbacks like that's that's an interesting reveal, but it would be kind of cool to know earlier on. Yeah. Or have it be part of the rewatchability of it. Right. But it's neither of those. It's neither of those. And then, in my opinion, doesn't come into play at all. Other than there's some heartfelt moments at the end where he's still trying to play tough and the bird is telling Deku how he really feels. Right. But the bird's crying. Right. Which is fine. But that should have been throughout. Like, that's what I'm talking about. There's that one scene, but it's in the Deuma at the end, the very last little bit that so it, it's it's all but meaningless that that's his his ability. And it's cool. 
I mean, that's a cool one to come up with. That's what I'm saying. Use it. Yeah, it's a cool quirk. Use it. Yeah. Use it more. And we've watched a lot of anime where when you watch it the second time, you can pick up a lot of new things. Mm -hmm. The next one I have is it includes the pretty tired and old uh, swapped suitcase that looks exactly the same (laughs) trope thing. I'm not a big I'm not. I mean, it's fine like but i do remember internally groaning a bit when it was like oh there's two suitcases that look the same and oh they're gonna get swapped out or whatever it could have just been what he was trying to hand over well the guy stole it from humorize the other scientist stole it from humorize so that's why it wasn't but you could have just had him set you could have just made Rody a minor thief and had him just set the suitcase down and have Rody steal it and run away. And then, you know, same same kind of deal. Yeah, I thought where it was going is that he was by association. Rody was working for Humanize through the bartender. And humorize. the suitcase that he was... Yeah, Humorize. What did I, did I say? Humanize, humanize again. again? Yeah. <laughs> humorize. Humorize does sound um, like you're adding humor to it, though. So, you know. Yeah, that'll help me remember it, maybe, though. But yeah, I didn't like this the swap suitcase. Jessica, what is your uh, your second and last diss? My second and last diss is when Humorize revealed their plan to unleash the gas in 25 zones that were marked on the global map for everybody to see that was publicized on all of the TV channels. And they said, well, heroes, we're going to give you two hours to try to go in and disarm (laughs) all the gas bombs and i was like oh because it was i was so like on the edge at that at that moment i'm like oh man i was just really in it and then they're like we're gonna reveal every zone where the problems are and then you know give you two hours to fix it and i'm like oh they couldn't come up with anything better than that um so that was my second disc but they they did recover that plot line some when it was turned out to be a trap to make that perfect because of course because the bombs only kill people with quirks correct yeah that's true Mm -hmm. and so what what the what a smart villain would do is say you have two hours here they are Ah, and then in an hour and a half bing yeah (laughs) you know like don't actually have the two don't have it last exactly to the second of two hours So you get them all there and they're like, well, we still have a half an hour. Boom. You know, but villains aren't always smart. No, they have to be dumb. It's the it's the same to me. It's the same trope as like, all right, you're in you're going to die now, hero. I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee and just trust (laughs) that when I come back, you'll be done this machine. Yeah, yeah, it's very much that way. Well, let's talk about the bad guy, the bad guy then, because. And uh, again, we're just going to spoil his quirk, which was like hilarious. What a shock. The glowing blue guy has a quirk, <laughs> <laughs> even though he's the leader of Humorize and he has like a weird like circuit board mustache. He has a quirk. Amazing. What a what a shock. What a reveal. It was dumb that they played that up as like a thing where they were surprised as a reveal. Yeah. I mean, we all knew he had one. When they revealed it, I was like, oh, that's awesome. Because his his quirk is basically anything that attacks him, he shoots back at you. So he's unbeatable. And this is, I'm going to get into my big diss and why I would not send this to people who don't like anime. Because every time someone disses anime, and I've done this, I feel like it's the same thing. There are no stakes because someone will just get a new power or power up and then win. Mm Mm-hmm. And when they first revealed that his power was to send all powers back and they had not yet revealed Rhodey's power, I thought, this is awesome. And I started thinking of what, what's Rhodey's power going to be that it'll combat this guy's power? What clever way are they going to stop this guy who is seemingly unbeatable? What There's got to be... And I start thinking, well, maybe Rhodey's power suppresses other powers, but then why would he be embarrassed about it? Because that's kind of cool, and it didn't suppress Deku's spider Manning. Could it be if the the bird is close to you, it 
it also reflects i was trying to think of different ways and like how could they beat this guy and i but i was waiting for a, a awesome clever conclusion but instead it was i'll just increase my power because he has a sudden power cap and that was so lame and just it it killed this movie for me because it was so lame such a deus ex machina there's they tried to explain it away like it's because you didn't trust other people or and it made no sense that so there was no clever it was just i'll just use my most powerful move which for me is is like a weird if i'm an anime character i'm opening with my most powerful move i'm not gonna open with my weakest move and then move to my next strongest move and then move move to my most powerful move i'm just gonna i'm opening with united states of smash world whatever I'm I'm just going to I'm opening with that and that's and I'm hoping that's enough. And then if that doesn't work then we're in trouble and that's and that can make some interesting stakes. That's why I loved it so much though. <laughs> and I loved it and it reminded me of one of my favorite characters from Hunter x Hunter which is Gon. And I loved Gon. He also had a lot of he wore green too and he would always power through with another tough move and he just became it was like a video game and you just level up and level up uh, similar to um um what's the other one with kirito sword art online sao was like that as well where you just kind of start out and power up and power up and i i loved it because it just it reminds me of final fantasy and video games and you'll see we'll clear this game and go home soon that's how you overcome the bosses. I don't know. It gets me jazzed up. So that's so cool that we both like such different things. A lot of the modern anime is that it's power ups. It's like breaking through to a new level, that type of thing. I, I do want to address a little bit about this. So one, Merv, I 100% agree about the roadie power. I was waiting for the exact same thing for like 20 minutes of this movie. Yeah, I was waiting for roadie's quirk to be something weird that inadvertently countered fleck turns quirk i i was thinking the exact same thing and then when that didn't happen that was that was disappointing for me for sure the other piece of it though and this would be tough for anyone not familiar with this particular anime is there is lore that it is a common thing that quirks wear down the more they get used, you you get wore down. And then the bigger thing you use, especially with Deku's quirk, is he's broken arms, fingers, legs, and put himself out of battles because he's gone too hard too fast. But you wouldn't know any of this, you know, going into it just as a movie. So although it's not near as cool as it would have been with it being the roadie quirk reveal. At minimum, there's at least lore reasons to within the universe to explain this. I also want to talk a little bit about kind of your non-anime friend piece. And I, I think that's a good point. Like if you're new to anime or or you feel that way about anime, oh, they're just it's just 20 minutes of them powering up and getting stronger to beat the bad guy. Like if that's how anyone feels about anime, yeah, this my hero academia is not the anime for them. Uh, Sword Art Online's not the an the good news though is there are anime with a lot of stakes that are completely different where whole casts of characters get uh, Game of Thrones where all of a sudden all of your favorite characters are killed off in like two episodes so the good news is although a lot of the um, the more modern anime that people hear the names of or are familiar with is a lot of power ups and positivity power ups and positivity right but there are a lot of anime and we've watched them yeah i was gonna say this is this is the only one where i really felt that is that all our disses let me make sure i don't have any more oh the only other uh one i have is the coincidency coincidence where it's roadie's dad who happened to be the one who was involved with humor eyes and that was just completely random and you know that i always struggle kind of with those super coincidency coincidences but um other than that i'm good and then they brought they brought that back with the puzzle box that roadie had been getting which was also like again set up 
moments before it happened. But then they're all staring at it and they're like, oh, how can we do this? How can we do this? And Rhodey's like looking at it. And what, Rhodey, why aren't you just jumping in? It takes him a while to just jump in because he should know. And there should have been more of a moment. That that would have been a great moment too, where Pinu, is that the bird's name? Yeah. Super cute little bird. Is sad or blue, I don't know, depressed, wistful. I don't know what the word what what emotion we could see on him. But I would like to see him having some emotion that we're confused by. Why is the bird having that emotion right now? To have some foreshadowing, to have some setup. And then because he knows his dad put that in there. Yeah, and it did seemingly take him a minute or two to, like, remember. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, I think I know what this is. You should have known, like, right away. I think the coincidency, coincidence, and the suitcase are kind of intertwined in that way, where they could have just made the suitcase where Rhodey is more involved, whether on purpose or not, with the humorized organization. He's doing kind of this small crime work delivery for them. And then that at least would make it make a little bit more sense that he was the one whose dad, I just, you know, the the two that I had an issue with regarding the suitcase and the coincidence and even the puzzle, because that's an extension of that. I feel like that would have been an easy fix. So I, I'm starting to struggle, I think, more and more with those when they come up. Well, it's a, it's a real easy fix. You could just have him working for Humorize yeah. and deciding to steal the suitcase because the only reason he was working for Humorize was to get back at his dad who betrayed him. And so now he thinks he can steal this suitcase and make some money. And then it's just full of papers and they're after him. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of times the easier fixes are harder to forgive than the big disbeliefs. But are we going to move to likes? Yeah, go ahead. I want to say something here as we get into the likes. And then we'll let Jessica waterfall out. I have 11 likes. 11. Okay, I got I got four. But one thing that I do want to say is I don't dislike My Hero Academia. In fact, the other movie I watched, I don't know. I think I'm almost positive it was the second one. I should have looked it up. But I liked that one quite a bit. Okay. And I understand why people like My Hero Academia because it is it's got all like the quirks. The world is really cool. So I like that movie. And that was my absolute introduction into My Hero Academia. And I didn't even dislike it. It was just, again, it'd be very difficult for me to recommend it. Partic- I didn't go one because if you like My Hero Academia, obviously, as you you two are, can attest, if you like it and you like really modern anime, you're going to like this. Right. And I think most of those like coincidental plot points and simple plots work to just get to your set pieces. We need to have these two people fight with this new kind of cool quirk. We need to have these two people fight we have, you know, we need these set pieces. So, yep. And that's a great point. And I will talk about that when I discuss why for me it was a five and not a four, because one of those set pieces is what forgave all the other issues <laughs> I had and made it where I just loved it and would tell people to watch it. So, Jessica, what's one or two of the things that you really liked? Oh, man. Am I have to narrow it down? I can't go through all 11. Well, we do a couple back and forth, right? So you can do a one or two and then I'll do some. And Okay, sounds good. The first thing that I liked is actually a quote. And I don't know, I just, I liked this and I thought it applied to so many things, even just beyond anime. But the quote was talking about you know, referencing Humorize and that they were taking a total hypothetical idea and using it to justify their crimes. I think it's technically a hypothesis is what it would be. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that was a cool. I like that. I like that quote, too. Yeah. And in the quote, it even says hypothetical. And that is that something from the show or is that something that they introduced in this movie? Yeah, it's a direct quote from the show, from the movie. No, from the movie. But I mean, it's not it's not. I didn't know if that was a sub a subplot in the actual show itself or from the manga. There there are um, a lot of discussion about getting rid of quirks and it's very x-men in that way where Mm -hmm. a lot of the villains their motivation is to get rid of heroes get rid of quirks i mean i feel like you could call my hero academia weird x-men yeah 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 but i loved it that was a direct quote from the movie yeah that i i just really i was like wow that's so insightful um 
The next thing that I liked was when Deku was, this was near the beginning and he was jumping on like buildings and jumping around and he was trying to get to the bad guy at the time who was Rhodey. And then this is the first time that we met the bird and the bird punched him in his face with his face and fluffed. Did a bird fluff? (laughs) (laughs) Nice. We call those farts in my house. Yeah, a (laughs) big fart. (laughs) And we're not allowed. And when we build forts, we're not allowed to have fort farts. Okay. Because we're in that we're under the blanket, no fort farts. Yeah, some of the humor landed in this for sure. I don't remember that part, but it sounds hilarious. Oh, how, yeah, how do you not? It was pretty funny. I did, and it was great. And it was a face punch with the bird's face in his face with a fart, and it was great. Um, so loved that one. And then I'll go, I'll go into my number three, and then if you guys want to share one. Okay, I loved the bridge scene attack. I thought it was great music. And it was the first time that we saw the green archer girl and she was firing her arrows from far away. And Deku and and Rhodey were trying to get away from her in a very Spider-Man-esque way. And I thought the animation just looked fantastic around the bridge and you just felt like you were falling and turning and running and escaping with them. And I was just very much in the moment. That scene was cool. The Spider-Man stuff was cool. I like how anime unabashedly takes inspiration from a lot of other stuff and just puts it in. So the archer to me looked just like Link in Zelda. I think there's a lot of, I mean, you have like green arrow and stuff. I think the green like Robin Hood is like the archer with like the green hood, I think is like a common is a is a classic trope. That's fair. That's completely fair. And I would also argue that Although it may look like Spider-Man, I would say that it's more Attack on Titan movement than Spider-Man movement. Because in Spider-Man, he's web, 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 right? Attack on Titan, it's two. Like he does. So good anime movies. And I think, and we'll get to it. I think Mugen Train is an example of a good anime movie based off a show. I believe that good anime movies that are based on shows and manga, of course, need to feel epic compared to the show counterpart. And I feel that this movie did a good job of that, where it felt big and world and global. And they did a lot of really good things to make it feel like a bigger thing than the shows. Now, not take anything away from the shows. Obviously, I like them. But this felt compact and it felt epic to me. Sure. You don't want 20 minutes of slice of life. Yes. In in a movie. Yeah. Very good point. Yep. What's something else you liked, Murph? I'm going to start with this one because I already mentioned it. But I I like the move of having Rhodey as the protagonist separate from the main character and letting the story arc move through him. That's not an easy thing to pull off a lot of times. And they pulled it off seamlessly. I, I think everything that Rhodey went through was uh, set up very well. And how many movies have they done that with and failed? The one that comes to mind recently is like the Mortal Kombat movie. So they introduced a different protagonist in the new Mortal Kombat movie, and he was terrible, and no one liked him. I, I didn't see that um, one. I like the old Mortal well, Kombat movie, like the 89 yeah, one. Yeah, for sure. 90. For sure. 90 something. 97. But, um, the, uh, Somewhere between I, no, 1980 I and 2000. I know that movie came out. Somewhere. I'm a film buff. I know it came out in that yeah. two decades. Somewhere in there. Yeah. For lack of a better way to say it, it hinders the fan service. And this didn't do that at all. I thought he was a good character. He was a likable character. Even when he was doing bad things, you still were rooting for him. Especially that moment where you see where he's living and, and that he's taking care of his siblings and stuff. He was highly likable. Yeah, you were rooting for him because he was in a situation through no fault of his own, was good at what he did, and was funny. Like, he hit a lot of the boxes. Jessica, what's another one you have? All right, I've got a bunch. I liked the part when Shoto and Bokugo, did I, am I saying his name right? No idea. Bakugo. Is that the grenade kid? Yeah, the grenade guy. I loved when they they got the message from Deku that... 
he he sent them a text message and they were able to decode it and they talked together and they were smart enough to figure out that he was fleeing to this other land, the next country over. And they're like, oh, we just have to go after him. I loved that. Nobody had to spell it out for them. They were super smart, great heroes on their own, and they were able to just go after him. And it gave me a sense of relief because, you know, we've got Deku being chased by everyone. And I'm like, whew, okay. His friends are coming for him. We're going to be okay. And I like, the, they're both really strong characters as well. Almost equally as cool to Deku. Deku. So I really liked that. And I may be a little dumb, but even knowing that, I was still somewhat surprised at the moment that they showed up. Like they showed up when they showed up. I didn't think it was going to be that moment. I thought there was going to be another way they got out of that. And I did do a little cheer inside when that's when they were able to find him was at that that key moment, which is, you know, can be bad, can be exciting, but I thought it warmed my heart in this for sure. Uh, Murphy, got anything else you wanted to discuss? Positive favorites? Yeah, I like the overall plot. I think you could do you can do a lot of interesting things. Now I'm an X-Men fan from long ago. Previously on X-Men. Mostly 90s stuff, Jim Lee, Chris Claremont era, uh, Silvestri. This has a lot of X-Men vibes, and it makes sense for for humanity to be like, whoa, hold on, what's happening here? There's a lot of very powerful people going around. I feel very helpless. I think it would. it's a good plot that I was surprised actually didn't come from the show because you could you could do a lot with it, and it really makes sense to have small, helpless people feel like they need to find some way to defeat quirks or because there's a lot of villains too that are that are using their quirks for bad. Yeah, and it is usually the villains that are going after the quirks, obviously, but where that gets even stronger, Deku's whole thing, his whole origin story is he was a quirkless kid. He was one of the 20% that didn't have a quirk, but he wanted to be a hero so bad just more than anything and he is able to have a conversation with all might who's his idol and he's like all might even though i don't have a quirk can i still be a hero and all might's like well you gotta some sort of like you have to be realistic or you know you you can do great things but you got to be realistic and then later he sees deku who's midoriya at that point no deku yet he sees him rush into a, a situation to save Bakugo with no no quirk, no powers at all in a losing battle just rushes in and the comment is, you know, true heroes their body moves before they know what's happening to do the right thing to save people. So that inspires All Might to go in and, and save Bakugo and then later there's the most played, the most touching scene of all of My Hero Academia where he All Might looks at Midorian says, young man, you too can become a hero. And then he passes his quirk on to Midoriya and he becomes Deku, the superhero, the hero at that point. Young man, you too for me hero. So you're right, that is a great plot and to add on to that even more how it connects to the lore where our our main character is someone who was powerless who was quirkless who wanted to be a hero and then was given that opportunity to now look at i if i was one of the 20 percent, i wouldn't want them to have quirks either <laughs> if i'm honest right. and whether that would be out of jealousy or fear probably jealousy i mean it can be both two things can be true at the same time yeah just like a pleasure and pain are in opposites, you can feel the pain of being hungry, the pleasure of eating while you're eating, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Next one I want to talk about is the team up. The team up, the team up, the Shoto, Deku, Bakugo team up. So anyone who is a My Hero Academia fan, when it was those three going into the final battle against already Frecht, Lung, Left Turn, what? Fleck Turn. Fleck Turn. Um, when it's those three going into that final battle, every My Hero Academia fan lost their minds because those are the three that everyone loves. Everyone loves Bakugo because 
he's got that attitude all the time and he's always like shut up nerd and he's got he's hilarious and shoto's the kind of gloomy stoic serious one and then deku's the very hyper hero who just wants to do the right thing and seeing those three team up in that way really it's a four but that makes it a five for me like that alone if you are at all a fan you need to see the movie just for that i would agree with that yeah i've got i've got a i've got definitely some more i'll skip ahead to it one of mine that kind of piggybacks off of yours again i love the trio the deku shoto and bo oh my gosh i can't say his name right bokago <laughs> bakugo or Kachan. You could say Kachan. Bakugo. I gotta I've gotta write it better. Okay, Bakugo. Yeah, phonetically, that's what I do. Yeah. So And still get it and I still get it wrong, still get names wrong most of the time. I write them phonetically and Yeah. I loved it though. I am a huge fan of Demon Slayer. And it reminded me so much of that trio, but as superheroes that were smart and unique and interesting and i just oh i loved it i just ate it up i thought it was absolutely fantastic and those those end battles they each had crazy bad guys oh, i like the battle with the it was like scorpion razor hands with the clown raptor twins <laughs> those guys were sweet yeah, they were sweet and they just kept coming back and it was Bakugo who was fighting them and it was perfect for his personality and they were just such evil, nasty, bad guy clowns. And they were, uh, they were, yeah, it was, it reminded me of uh, one of the the clown bad guys from Hunter x Hunter and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Maybe we'll show it in the video, but times like a hundred. It was, it was so good. I absolutely loved it. So I really love that. And then I've got I've got more likes here. So another thing that I really loved is when Rhodey had his flashback of his happy life with his dad before his dad at, at the time we didn't know, but before his dad was kidnapped to go to humorize. And it just showed his beautiful life with his brother and sister and in a, a gorgeous house. And they looked so happy with just them and their dad. And then it was so heartbreaking when his dad was kidnapped to go to Humorize and their house was all graffitied and then they lost everything and they ended up at the trailer park and they just didn't, their their dream life had faded and now he was basically working as a criminal to support his brother and sister. And I cried. I had real tears. I think what also makes that more poignant is the fact that Rhodey up until the end thought that was a betrayal, not a kidnapping, right? So he thought it wasn't just had this happy life with his parents and then all of a sudden the dad leaves and betrays the family and just leaves them, you know, the whole I'm going to go get a pack of cigarettes trope and never come back. And, and that's what he had been dealing with is this very sharp contrast between what he had the actions he had seen from his father and then this seeming betrayal which yeah i thought that was poignant too the other one i had is also a quote and this was deku and i i loved this so much and he said it's kind of my life's dream to help someone i want to be someone who saves people with a smile on my face I want to be like All Might. And I'm like, oh, man, it made me tear up because it made me think about how I want to be like my dad, you know, because All Might is basically my dad. And so I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to cry. That is so sweet. Um, so I love that quote. Have you joined us yet? If not, then I'm sorry. I won't be sharing my dinner with you. I just love that Deku and Tanjiro. And I'm a, just such a big fan of the, the easiest thing to compare it to is Superman, right? If you look at Superman more often than not, he's a symbol of peace, right? Right. He's he's good incarnate and he's always good and he's always trying to help people. And it's not for money and it's not for fame and it's not for power. It's just through a, a core desire to want to do good. It's because he was raised in the Midwest. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and I just I love that that 
in Superman and I'm growing as I grow older and the world gets more cynical and more fighting and more nasty. And I just, I appreciate that more and more and more as time goes on. So Jessica, to your point, the fact that Deku, that is not the first time he said that it won't be the last time. Like he wants to help people and he wants to do it with a smile on his face to inspire them just like he was inspired by all might. And I think that is needed and uh, something that everyone should have to experience right now is some sort of an entertainment where it's just goodness for goodness sake, no ulterior motive whatsoever. In fact, right here, it's my little, my new little Deku that I just got. Looks great. So anyway. I was going to say one of the things I really like, and the reason I think people like My Hero Academia and why I would definitely watch more of it is the quirks are creative and they're interesting. And what I love that it does, and you see this a little bit in comics, but not enough in comics and definitely not in modern comics that aren't independents and really not in mainstream comics that aren't independents just in general, is play with the medium. And you have characters like you didn't like the 2D guy, the 2D Egyptian guy, but I love that because <laughs> no. you can't do that in a so, so. live action movie. And you can't right. have one character who is chibi anime, big head, big eyes, and another character who's very realistic. But you have these different characters where literally some of them, their power is straight, perfectly drawn energy beams that you would expect in any sort of photorealistic action anime and then other ones that are like scribbles and so and that's cool that's awesome that they're that they play with that that they can take chances that there's some weird quirks this character is weird we don't have to see him all the time we can see him once in a while because it's such a big cast to kind of have different iconography from very realistic to purely symbolic icons and everything in between. Yeah, there's a girl that can make anything from like the, I think it's like the lipids or something in her body. She literally can just make anything, make a cannon, make a... Is that the girl who is spitting out like communicators or something in the show? Or... Yep, exactly. I would try to remember her name, but I will butcher it. Anyone who's watched the show will know who I'm talking about. There's a girl that can make mushrooms grow anywhere. And you think that's really dumb. That's a dumb power. But when she makes a mushroom grow in someone's throat, <laughs> all of a sudden it goes from being something silly and dumb to, wow, that's serious business right there. That's intense. So to add to that even more, other than the Egyptian guy, he's just he's just the one I, he I just... Go under doors. What, <laughs> he could go under doors. He could go under doors. And that'll probably happen. There'll be some moment in the future where he does something cool. And I'm like, okay, fine. But um, that does happen a lot where it's you don't. Yeah, like that's just silly. And then it becomes serious, which is cool, too. I'll be interested if uh, you start watching the actual show, what your thoughts are. I mean, I assume we'll do season one at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's a very inspiring, touching one. So um, what's something else I have? I liked Flex Turns Quirk, and I felt it was a little rushed, but and, and it made it a little bit confusing, but I like when they started talking about his motivation and how because he repels everything, he repels people's feelings as well. So when anyone would like go to love him, he would repel that. And I just I thought that was a really interesting concept. I do wish they would have spent a little bit maybe some of the quieter moments talking about that because it was done very much in the middle of all the power up action. Well, and he tried to kill himself, but could not kill himself because everything. Yeah, it was dark. It got kind of dark. That got dark fast. Um, but I thought it was a cool power. And I, I just really appreciate that. They at least took the time to make it where you could understand, even though he had a quirk, You'd be like, why would you want to get rid of quirks? You have a quirk, seemingly a really good quirk. Right. Most people would think that's a great quirk. The effect was and awesome then, too. The the big like black tornado that would come off him and get yeah. bigger as more power was put in. Speaking of X-Men, one of my favorite X-Men characters is Rogue, and it's for that reason. 
And she's a good character, but if she touches anybody, she steals their power, the, basically their life force, and she can take people's power in that in that way. But also in her backstory, she was getting touchy feely with one of her boyfriends when she was young, and she kills him, and that kind of shapes her character. And I, that's always been one of my favorite. Always, she's always been one of my favorite X Men. Rogue was my favorite too, and I, and in the comics, she could fly. And I loved that. Like, yeah, she took she took uh, Miss Marvel's powers. She had kind of almost no powers or baseline powers, and then eventually took Miss Marvel's powers so she could fly and was way more powerful. And yeah, and then the the X Men movies they just had her with the kissing power, and I'm like, oh, she's supposed to fly. <laughs> Is this a kissing book? <laughs> right. This is a deep cut Princess Bride reference. If anyone got it, yeah, watch the uh, '90s cartoon. 90s x-men cartoon yeah get flying rogue when i think of x-men i think of the 90s cartoon that i'd watch on saturday mornings me too eating fruit snacks it's still very good it holds up for, for me one other one i had is that is about the bird i knew the bird was the quirk very early i didn't know why but just it was very out of place well it's because it's there and weird yeah yeah and so i knew it had something to do with the bird and I thought it was a cool quirk. But now going back through it later, I'm like, I do see it as a little bit of a missed opportunity, especially on rewatchability. But I did thought I thought that was a really cool quirk. It was a cool quirk that was underused. Yeah. And I did like that kind of the bird saved the day with the chip and all that. I mean, we knew it was going to be fine. Right. There's no way that it was going to be the bombs go off and everyone's quirk explodes and turns them into turtles or kills them or whatever right um we knew that wasn't going to happen but i did think that was cool that the bird was like got it i just got one last thing and it's actually two moves so <laughs> there were two like <laughs> battle moves i was like yes and it was like my heart my soul came out so the first one was shoto's bless freeze heat wave attack i loved that that was just like the juice and then the second one was, uh, it was, what was his name? Bakugo's. There you go. Bomb tornado against the clown serpent razor twins. And it was like, brah, you will not move. Brah. And they put it right in the wall and they were done zos. And I'm like, yes, I love this movie. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that reminded me, that guy is power, and I i mean, I know he's a, I guess he's a main character, the fire and ice guy. Yeah. Reminded me of a really good story by Amy Bender, who is one of my favorite fantasy writers, magical realism, I guess you would say. And it's a story about a girl whose hand is ice, and another girl whose hand is fire, and they're shunned, but they become lovers, and when they touch, it negates their power, so that they're like the only two that that they can touch each other. It's very good. It's a very good. She's a very good writer. Sounds good. So Shoto's backstory is kind of tragic and interesting. His father endeavors the number two hero. Oh, okay. Where All Might's a symbol of peace and Superman, right? Endeavor is, and and Marv, I'm sure you'll be able to come up with a Western superhero that people could relate this to. And Endeavor is very ambitious and he wants to be number one and he's not really good with people and not very friendly and he's just out, you know, kind of for himself. And as he goes on and he sees how big the gap is between himself and All Might and how tough it's going to be for him to become number one, he starts, and you'll have to forgive the language, but he starts trying to breed kids that can become number one. So he finds a woman with the ice powers and, you know, marries her or whatever. I don't, maybe they don't get married. I don't know, but ends up having kids with her. And he keeps just having kids, having kids trying to get the, the child with the right quirk abilities that could be number one. And it becomes being Shoto. And his mother ends up in like a mental institution. And it's, it's pretty tragic, but. For a long time, he refuses to use his dad's side. He refuses to use the fire side of his abilities. He only uses the ice. will only use the ice. And it limits him because he'll use so much ice where he'll start to freeze. 
And all he would have to do is use that firepower for just a moment to like heat up his body and he could use it again. And then eventually in a big fight at a school kind of festival, uh, Midoriya or Deku actually gets him to think about it differently and he starts using his dad's side. And it's, it's a really tragic and cool story. Yeah, it sounds cool. I think Endeavor is like a sweet, his design is cool. I like his flame mustache. Yeah, <laughs> the mustache man. Yeah, yeah. He's the number one Japan hero, right? Well, he's number one now. So All Might, when All Might had to retire, he became the number one de facto hero. Okay. He was super pissed because he's like, this is not how I wanted to become the number one hero. I wanted to do it through beating you, All Might. Blah. But how is, how is having a kid that's better than him beating him? I don't know. The explanation is he saw how wide the gulf was between him, his abilities and All Might. And there's even this really cool scene where he walks up to All Might and he's like, what does it mean to be a symbol? Like, how do I become a symbol now that I'm the number one hero? How do I do what you did? And All Might's like, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. You can't just repeat what I've done or copy what I did. You're going to have to figure this out for yourself. And we're starting to see him change as well and become better. That's a cool dynamic. And you say, like, I don't think there'd be a Western equivalent to that. You have characters that are for all intents and purposes superman ripoffs like rob liefeld supreme who's like what if superman was a dick but i don't think you have a western equivalent because it's very rare for we're it's, it's starting to happen now in the movies like well this character is the most powerful no this one is mm. but that was something only nerds would discuss at <laughs> lunch tables yeah yeah it wasn't something that was canon Right. Like this character is obviously the number one character, you know, the number one power. Incredible Hulk is the number one strongest, but Thor is trying to be the strong. They, you just don't have that dynamic, I don't think, in Western and Western comics. I, I could be wrong, but I can't think of anything. My Hero Academia talks a lot more about, you know, the financial aspects of it, how this is a paid job and are heroes doing it for the right reasons? Are they doing it for fame and money or are they doing it because they're really trying to help people? It's like a sports league, right? Like yeah, an analogous yeah. to a sports league. There's pros and minor yeah. leagues and students. That's a great way to put it. It's like the NFL with superpowers. So you've got the number one draft pick, the number one quarterback in the league, most touchdowns, most saves, most citizens rescued, whatever. And they get the billion dollar bonuses and then yeah it's very much like that and i also like that there's always a yeah but to their powers in my hero academia like kryptonite although there are the anime trope power-ups and i just got stronger in order to break through this barrier there are still hard and fast rules and every quirk has a yeah but there's a guy that can blast out electricity and he's always having to charge everyone's cell phones and stuff like that. But if he uses like a supercharged attack, it's like all of the energy also goes out of his brain and the neurons and stuff stop firing so well. And he's like dumb for like 20 minutes and can't, he's like, dur, 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 dur. so as one of my favorite ones, but they all have a yeah, but Midori is, or, you know, Deku's is that he'll, he starts breaking his body apart and at a point they're like if you keep doing this you're not going to be able to do this at all so there's always a yeah but lest the western audience gets too like high and mighty about this that's how most of superman's powers came about early on he was just really strong so he could run fast because his leg muscles were so strong and he could jump really high because his leg muscles were really strong he couldn't fly flying came later but then also when they needed it, suddenly he had ice breath because I need to get out of this. And then that becomes canon. And then I have laser beam eyes, you know, heat vision that becomes canon. So those powers kind of came later in the Deus Ex Machina kind of power up kind of situation as well. Jessica, what else do you want to say about My Hero Academia? Absolutely loved it. That's it. I just had a fantastic time going to the movies with you guys and. Um, it just really excited to be on the show and it was such a amazing surprise, uh, how much I love the movie. I'm glad you could be here. What type of person 
should go see this movie. I think people who like magic, people who think magic is interesting and like to think about different types of magic because that's really what the quirks are. And people who like superheroes and action, actually, you know, it's there was a lot of high energy throughout the movie and it I was on the edge of my seat a lot of the times I was crying some of the times because it did a great job with the emotion and just really pulling you into the story and I just really enjoyed it and I was happy to have a little bit of background of the My Hero Academia like I like you said I'd watched about 12 episodes or so and I'm definitely going to be watching all the rest of them with you uh but it was nice to have a little bit of background going in so I could connect with the characters the most so i would say someone who likes those things and maybe has watched a little bit of my hero academia likes what they saw and wants to be blown away by a great movie conversely who shouldn't go see this movie well i guess people who don't like the superhero don't like superheroes (laughs) i'm not really okay that's fair that's fair (laughs) Merv, who should go see this movie? Yeah, I I think you definitely have to have some background in My Hero Academia, even more than I, I mean, obviously more than I have to really enjoy it. Now, I just love going to the movies. I'll go see whatever movie. I love going to the theater. I have a subscription, so I can go see as many movies as I, well, it's like three movies a week. So I just enjoy the experience. It was fun going with you guys, except after the movie, because I'm always like, I like to sit there and, I sit through the credits usually, and I like to talk about the movie after. But I think you have to have some background, even more so than the other movie. The other movie I watched, I I enjoyed quite a bit more, the second one. So I think those are the people who really should watch it. And I guess there's no reason to not watch the other, at least the other two movies first, before you watch this one, if not not a lot of the show, before you watch this one. I think My Hero Academia is doing superheroes probably better than anybody right now. So, yeah, I think that's fair. Who shouldn't go? Who shouldn't see this movie? Grumpy old curmudgeons. <laughs> I think that's it. Like, if you honestly, and there's nothing wrong with it, to each their own. But if you, if when you see insane power ups in the anime or you see, you know, Dragon Ball Z is the one usually people are familiar with. Yeah. Where, you know, they're powering up for a whole episode for this one finishing move. You know, if those types of things just instantly get on your nerves, then maybe this one isn't for you. I would put myself in that camp and it doesn't get on my nerves. It just takes away all the stakes because for me, and and like I said, my writer friends are generally the people who are the hardest on this kind of thing because it becomes a deus ex machina where I'm not really worried because I know they're just going to unleash their next new move. Wait, remind me what your quirks are again and your name. And so it's predictable and it's it's not I'm not excited for a clever turn or anything like that for better, or for worse. To me, the show especially does a really good job of, you know, that everything's going to turn out OK. You know that Deku isn't going to get killed. You know, even if he ends up in the hospital, there's quirks that can help him with that. You know, everything is going to be OK. Yet they do a pretty good job of still creating tense moments. And I, th- I thought they did a pretty good job of this, especially with the other two battles. And even though I knew they were going to be OK, Shoto's underwater, he's like drowning. And, you know, Bakugo's, like you said, been skewered. So I thought they did, even though I knew it was going to be OK, I thought they did a pretty good job raising some tension there. I would say I would say similar. I think if you have any investment in my hero academia to me at that point it's a must watch because you will you will feel good the people who shouldn't see it are like we already discussed the folks that are going to be irritated by some of the modern anime tropes then you know you need to find another anime like steins gate or you know some of the others we discussed on the channel to watch and that'll be much more your speed sure does anyone else have anything else you would like to say about my hero academia world's mission world's heroes world mission world heroes mission it's world heroes mission because it doesn't make sense to me i feel like it should be heroes international mission is what it should be called (laughs) but it's not it's called world heroes mission yeah it's the world heroes the heroes of the world world heroes 
and they have a mission. It's actually because the institution is called the World Heroes something, something, something. So it's the mission that comes from the institution. It'd be like the United Nations mission. Makes sense. I loved your guys' perspectives. Great conversation. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we're pretty dumb. Anytime. In the description of whatever you're watching this on, you can find our link tree which will allow you to get to any other place that you can find us. Mm -hmm. You can support us through Teespring. There's a Discord link in there as well. Um, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to pitch. Yeah, I love this shirt. Animation! Yeah, you can get a shirt like that. It says animation. Animation shirt. Nice. I drew that. (laughs) Yeah, Merv drew that. He is quite the artist. So (laughs) all of the characters are original. Um, Well, that's all I got. So thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. It's over for you. You're done. But you'll be back.